We're really excited to be here. We've got a really fantastic panel of, of esteemed guests with us. And quite honestly, there's not really been a time when I've seen folks from all different communities come together and speak. So this is pretty exciting <coughs> for me, hopefully for y'all too. <laughs> so I want to give you a little bit of a background <coughs> on why we're here and what we're talking about. We're talking about startup communities. And what does that mean? Like, what's a startup community? It's not just a buzzword, it's something real. And we've seen all of us in our respective communities have been part of it and helped make them grow. So I want to give you a little bit of context and a little background before we just dive in. Um, have any of you guys heard of a gentleman named Brad Feld? Anybody? Yeah? Okay, cool. So Brad Feld is super successful. Um, he's now uh, um, an investor, and but he's really well known for one of his books called Startup Communities and really lays out a blueprint of how you can create an effective startup community, what the ingredients are that pull together all the necessary players in a community to make a really strong and successful community. So it's kind of called the Boulder Thesis. Um, and here in Atlanta, when we were thinking about creating the Atlanta Tech Village, it was something we thought a lot about and wanted to make sure that we followed. Um, you can really kind of sum it up as more is better. So there's four basic parts to it. So I want to outline these for you just to give you some context for what a startup community is all about. So first, the entrepreneurs must lead the startup community. That's the first basic tenet of it. Public sector, government, schools, people like you and I, we're all really important to the ecosystem, but the entrepreneurs should lead the ecosystem. And then all the leaders must have a long-term commitment. So a successful startup community is filled with people who are in it for the long haul, who are not just looking for a quick win, who are going to weather the ups and the downs that come with being an entrepreneur and being part of the startup world. And then thirdly, the startup community must be inclusive of anyone who wants to participate in it. So again, like I said at the beginning, more is better. More people, more talent, more ideas. All of those things, having more and more and more, yields more at-bats, more wins, and everybody together wins when there are more wins. And then the last piece of it is that the startup community must have continual activities that engage the entire entrepreneurial stack. So not just awards dinners and celebrations, but um, hackathons, startup weekends, things that really engage people from all different aspects of this ecosystem, because it's really multifaceted. So that's kind of the, the basis of what a successful startup community is. And so throughout this conversation, we're going to have folks um, talk about what their respective communities do. So let me give you an introduction to who all these folks are. So I'm going to start here on my left with Abby. Abby Clark is a community manager at 809 in Charlotte and also studio manager at Priceless Miscell Miscellaneous, mm -hmm. um, a video production studio in Charlotte. And she has grown and managed several entrepreneurial communities in Charlotte. She brings a really unique perspective to having started and grown a number of different communities focused on entrepreneurs. Um, she started her career as the manager of Packard Place. And uh, she's also run a number of accelerator programs. And she's now at this new place that I mentioned, 809. And she is also an entrepreneur herself. She has started her own payment platform startup called Pay My Sitter. To her left is Eric Dodds. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's co-founder and CMO of the Iron Yard. Now, many of y'all probably are familiar with the Iron Yard. Many of you maybe even taken a class at the Iron Yard. Um, they started in Greenville, South Carolina, but now they have campuses across the whole country and even into London. So Eric was born and raised in upstate South Carolina. He went to Clemson and he tutored in calculus, he studied marketing, and he graduated summa cum laude. And after school, he worked at a nationally renowned marketing shop where he developed content, he managed accounts and built strategies for companies like Best Buy and Doubleday. And he found cross paths with Peter Barth, um, the other co-founder of the Iron Yard, right at the beginning. And so jumped in together and built this really great network um, of education and training for technical trades across the US. Now next to your right is Karen Houghton, director of Atlanta Tech Village, based here in Atlanta. Have any of y'all not been to the village? Oh, you better get there. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So Karen is the director of Atlanta Tech Village. The Village is one of the largest co-working spaces and tech hubs in the US. There are over 250 tech companies in the building, which is over 900 people. The whole building itself is about 100,000 square feet. Now Karen oversees all the operations of the Village, including curating memberships, spearheading marketing initiatives, and running social media for the Village. And really the whole goal for her is to promote faster connections between ideas, talent, and capital here in Atlanta. Now next to her left is Jared, Jared Marquette. He's the director of development at Vilcap Communities, which is part of Village Capital. And he's currently located in Washington, DC, but he did recently come from Nashville. So Village Capital connects cities to na a national network of resources um, to help entrepreneurs grow and get the resources they need to thrive. Now he's also the coordinator of Steve Case's Rise of the Rest Tour, which was here just a couple months ago. So I hope some of y'all were actually there with us. That was a really fantastic day celebrating entrepreneurship in Atlanta. Um, so he leads that tour, bringing um, startup resources and information to ecosystems around the country, highlighting entrepreneurial activity. And before that, Jared was director of business partnerships for the Nashville Entrepreneur Center. Now last but not least is Ben. Ben Reeves over here on the far end. He has a really great perspective on all this as well. He is a senior associate in the tenant representation group of Jones Lang LaSalle. Basically Ben helps startups find their homes and set roots and grow their companies. So he has a decade of transaction experience for companies of all sizes, including startups, professional firms, corporate office space folks. Um, he's worked on a number of headquarter projects for all and Bird and AGL Resources. And he's also really involved here in Atlanta um, on the board of the directors for Piedmont Park. And he's also a member of the Atlanta Beltline's Young Leaders Council and the Atlanta Regional Commission's Millennial, Millennial Advisory Committee. And me, I'm Erin Rosentoski. Um, I'm currently a Senior Business Development Manager at Guild Quality and previously spent some time at Atlanta Tech Village helping that grow. So our discussion today is about startup communities, um, and I want to just kick it over to these guys and have them talk a little bit about what I mentioned at the beginning, that Boulder thesis. Is that something that you guys find in your communities? Do you, do you call it something else, or do you kind of follow that same path? Um, Abby, do you want to start? Sure. Um, can you guys hear me OK? OK, great. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Charlotte definitely subscribes to the more is better thesis. I think that um, we're still growing, and so we are still experiencing the more, um, hoping to get the, the, the more benefits out of it. Um, and one area where I think we really subscribe is uh, how we try to um, make everything very inclusive. More is better including more voices. Uh, some people will come to um, startup events or hackathons and say, well, why, why should I even be here? I don't have any technical talent. Um, I'm kind of sitting on the sidelines. So what really, uh, what kind of benefit am I bringing to uh, this particular event? Uh, but what we want to say is yes, more, 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 more voices, more diversity of voices. Um, Spanning all industries, uh, not, don't worry if you, I think a lot of people think, oh, entrepreneur, oh, tech. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have to be tech, it's anything. Because there are so many um, different elements to a business, so um, mm -hmm. we, we definitely try to uh, live the more is better lifestyle, for sure. Yeah. Eric, yes. do you have anything okay, to cool. add? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think we definitely subscribe to it. I mean, th those are the ingredients of success, right? I think for, for anything, especially a community. I think, I think one thing, um, aside from sort of general agreement, is in terms of having a really inclusive environment, I think that's really critically important. But I think it's also important to, ha to make sure that you um, are really intentional about honesty. Because I think that one thing that can happen in a highly inclusive environment is that people are afraid to tell other people that their ideas are bad, right? And that, you know, you create this, you create not inclusion, but you enable like bad ideas to, you know, germinate, which I don't think is healthy for a startup community. So I think that, 
Um, inclusion is really important with honesty layered in so that you know people can actually make progress on ideas that are, are really good right um, and get the ones out of the way that aren't good so um, I think in the south too you know it's a little bit interesting because we tend to be a little bit less direct just in our culture right I mean that's mm -hmm. just we're we're nice southern people right <laughs> and so I think that um, that's a mistake that I've seen happen a lot where, you know, we want to be super open. And I completely agree, like more and more and more. But sometimes I've seen, you know, even in Greenville um, and in lots of places where people aren't willing to tell other people or be honest with other people about their ideas. So um, I don't know, that, that was my thought on that is that I think that all these are really good, but I think that there's, you know, maybe a little caveat on that one. And, and you guys raised a good point. So here in the South, particularly, you know, we. Uh, may have the next amazing social media tool, but that's not everything that's coming out of the South, right? Like, uh, at the last Atlanta Startup Village, um, there was a really fantastic company that's working on agriculture, um, making a better water tool system for farmers. So we have a lot of interesting companies, and I think Karen and Jared and Ben could speak to some of the more interesting things that are happening in the startup community in the South that are not traditional tech, and they're, you know, they're things that can actually help people and make a difference and are not just you know how to find the restaurant closest to you so do you guys want to speak to some of those kinds of things I'd like to find the restaurant closest <laughs> <to you. laughs> um, I think Atlanta has tons going for it. anybody who's from Atlanta knows that our kind of blueprint in the startup e startup ecosystem has grown massively just in the past two to three years so it's a really exciting time for our city to kind of understand that density is better more is better um, with ATDC who's been around forever but you have Tech Square Labs opening up you have uh, Switchyard Strongbox West you have tons of these hubs you've got Alpharetta that's building their kind of entrepreneur system and I think it's super healthy and sometimes people get scared about competition um, in Atlanta Tech Village obviously just because we are so large we made a, a bit of a dent and a splash kind of in the ecosystem here but it's super healthy and I think as we're seeing that it's me and there's a lot more chatter even in just the metrics you're looking you know when you're talking about top you know, five top 10 uh, startup cities in the United States. Atlanta is slowly moving up that list and I think it's solely due to density because like Aaron was saying that it's density, the higher density, the more kind of, you know, up to bats you have and hopefully the more successes as well. So it's super exciting and I think the inclusivity as well is um, really important. So when you talk about Atlanta Startup Village, has anybody been to an Atlanta Startup Village? All right, if you're, all right, awesome, good. Because if you're in Atlanta and you've not been to Atlanta Startup Village, you need to go. It's the largest gathering of entrepreneurs in Atlanta on a monthly basis. It ha does happen at the village, but it's entrepreneurs who can pitch anywhere who's from Atlanta. So you don't have to be in the village. So it's any different kind of startup going on. And like Aaron was saying, it's not just tech. Uh, it's a lot of different folks. So it's a really cool opportunity. It's a really great networking opportunity. We live stream it. There's generally at least 400 or so people there. Um, and it happens to be really fun too, which is always good. Um, as far as kind of, I just walked around in a circle about what you asked, <laughs> didn't I? Uh, exciting things coming out. I mean, out of the village, you know, we call people who leave a really good thing because they're graduating. So not a lot of spaces get really excited when And then maybe leave. they meet Ben. That's right. <laughs> Time for more office space. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Um, and so that's a really exciting thing for us. So obviously Yik Yak, which we were talking about, you know, two guys, 23 years old, built an app in the village. They were sitting at a hot desk. Within a year and a half at the village, they had 74 million in funding, grew to a team of 50. Um, so obviously we're tech, so we're seeing lots of tech, but um, hopefully you guys know. Yeah, a lot without of a doubt. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about this beforehand that in my opinion, there's kind of a renaissance going underway in Atlanta, and it's not just tech. I mean, it's, it's really just all sorts of different type of creative industries. And you've got organizations like Wonder Root, which is really pushing the arts community forward in Atlanta, which Atlanta, you, know, you don't really realize, but the Orly plane crash wiped out basically a generation of our artist generation for Atlanta. And it took us a long time to recoup that. And organizations like that, and then you've got a huge rise of kind of artists and craft makers as well that are starting to come up in Atlanta. And it's, so it's to me where it gets really interesting in this talking about inclusiveness is 
how this kind of cultural voice comes together over time. And it's not forced, it happens very organically. And Atlanta's kind of just now starting to put those pieces together. And tech's a huge part of that. Like you said, ATDC's been here forever. And the amount that we've leveraged ATDC just over the past couple of years and the talent coming out of Georgia Tech and Georgia State, Atlanta University system, is now it's really starting to kind of see the dividends from leveraging up on those assets that, you know, frankly, we didn't really do a great job of leveraging previously. Now, Jared, with Rise of the Rest, you've actually been in, what, 15 different cities in the last year and a half? Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that and what you've seen from yeah. kind of that 10,000 foot view. Definitely, can you, you guys can all hear me, correct? All right, um, yeah, and I think just kind of to take away from what everyone's saying here, um, in terms of the Boulder thesis, like I think we can all agree that the four components of the Boulder thesis, you can't really argue with those, but I think that there's an overarching theme to the Boulder thesis that I tend to disagree with, and that's that everywhere can be Silicon Valley. And that's what he says, is you know, everywhere can be somewhere that is great for startups. And I just don't necessarily agree with that. I see a lot of places that can build great companies very early stage, regardless of the position or the sector that they're in, and then they hit a wall. And when I'm going from community to community, yeah, and we've done you know, 15 cities on Rise of the Rest, I guess I've done 16 on Rise of the Rest and probably 10 others through work with Google and National Entrepreneur Center and Village Capital, which is kind of what we do now. I'm on the road 20 to 25 days a week assessing different markets. And it, it's an organic growth of places. And what you have to be able to do is take advantage of the resources that are in place. And I think that sometimes we tend to ignore what that looks like in our communities. I think a great example, and, and um, it kind of comes from tragedy, but what you're seeing now is something that can't be replicated. We look at New Orleans and post Hurricane Katrina, we had an influx of Teach for America teachers that went into New Orleans. Those teachers are not traditional teachers. They're oftentimes educated in different backgrounds, <coughs> business backgrounds. They're teaching in a public school system. They become pretty disenfranchised with the school system. After their two-year contracts are up, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do next. And what do they do? They start ed tech companies. And now New Orleans is one of the best places in America for an ed tech business. I come from Nashville. And in the late 60s, HCA started in Nashville. It's now the largest healthcare company in the world. And Nashville's also home to CHS and LifePoint, the two of the other five largest healthcare companies in America. So if you're really looking at a place where you can find talent in healthcare, where you can find leadership in healthcare, where you can find early adoption, early customers in healthcare, people that have money, that understand the industry, that are willing to invest in it, it's the best place to be. And so I say that, and I think that all communities have to pay particular emphasis to what's going on around them. I think Atlanta is a different type of example. It was one of the most difficult rise of the rest cities that I ever did, because we try to come in and we try to find this personality and we try to find what are you good at and what can we tell people that they need to get, you know, gather around. and. There's a little more going on here. It's larger. There is a little more opportunity for funding, although I know everyone in Atlanta will disagree with that. Um, everywhere you go, people need more funding. Uh, but it kind of is the case. And so, I mean, just, I guess, to answer the question is, there's a lot of great things happening everywhere, but I think if you really get into the core of what that city is and how it became what it is, you find the opportunity for a competitive advantage that can't be replicated elsewhere that allows you to stay in your city and take advantage of those resources without having to move. And so through Raleigh with big data because of IBM being there and Chicago with the travel industry because of the Pritzkers and Boeing and it just each one of these have some really cool things that have happened. Baltimore, we just had a conversation with Johns Hopkins and Under Armour. And if I'm in Baltimore, I am starting a wearable technology company <laughs> or I am doing something in the sports medicine space because I have two great early customers and two great sources of leadership there. And so in all these communities, specifically around the Southeast, I think everyone's starting to recognize you can't compete with Silicon Valley, but Charleston can be the best place in America to start a tourism by the sea business. And Nashville can be the best place in America to start a healthcare business. And that can't be replicated. I want to come back to the question of capital later. But um, while we're kind of still at this high level, Eric, I want to ask you, with your perspective as well, having all of these Iron Yard programs across the country, how have you seen this idea of education change over the years that you've been with the Iron Yard, and, and what effect has that had on these communities? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's interesting, you know, I think education, I mean, the stuff that's happening in New Orleans, you know, with ed tech, and there's a huge amount of change going on. We're really focused on one particular slice of it, and that's training 
people to be ready for you know, entry-level positions as software developers. Um, but I think what's exciting about education in general is that I, you know, it varies by community. You know, Austin, Texas is different than Little Rock, Arkansas, right? And so openness to new formats of education um, definitely vary by market. But I think that a lot of people are really ready for new ways of doing education, right? Because they're seeing that a lot of the old ways aren't necessarily working. Now, that's kind of a dangerous statement being on campus at Georgia Tech, maybe, because they're a really established traditional school. But um, I think that places like Georgia Tech are adapting and trying unique things, right? It's not just that um, you know there are going to be companies like the Iron Yard that come in and disrupt education, right, and turn everything. Yeah, I think it's everyone working on ed tech software to Georgia Tech, you know, making their um, you know masters in computer science available online for six grand, right? I mean, stuff like that's awesome. So I think that I think we're seeing a lot of changes. Um, as far as us being in communities, I think we've seen a couple things that have been really interesting. I think, number one, we really want to, we call it being a good citizen of the places that we go. And part of that is making sure that instead of just being sort of a factory that mints graduates who go to work for software companies, it's asking them questions about, you know, how are you going to give back to the community once you're a part of it, right, in the tech space. Um, and I think that's been really good. So people who launch a new career, experience a big life change, but have been challenged to give back, I think has been really good. So, you know, one example of that would be, you know, in one of our markets, there was a JavaScript meetup that had died, you know, and our students resurrected it because they wanted a place where they could continue to learn and grow and collaborate with each other. So I think those sorts of things where our graduates coming out, you know, one way we can have an effect on the community is by motivating people to give back, right? And, and there are consistently more and more of those, um, which is really exciting. Um, I think... Uh, in terms of the startup space, I mean, our students go do all sorts of things, you know, enterprise companies, agencies, they, they go to work for all sorts of companies, but there have been many students who have started their own companies, um, which is really exciting. You know, they start their own startup, and some of them have failed, and some of them are still going, which is the way, you know, the way it is with startups, but I think that we've seen... With a format of education where in a couple months you can go from, you know, really having a very cursory knowledge of something and then being able to build and deploy an application that actual users can use is really empowering. And I think that that creates an entrepreneurial mindset to some extent. Now, I don't know if we're like, you know, the catalyst that's, you know, driving a startup ecosystem, but I think that's a really exciting thing because you have people who may have not wanted to be an entrepreneur may have not known that they wanted to be an entrepreneur until they realized like I can build something that someone can use and so I think that's kind of spurred the mindset a little bit in terms of mm -hmm. um, in terms of the startup community so that's been really exciting I think in um, I think the other thing is we, we sort of have in different markets um, you know, being a place of education, sometimes that means we're in a place that already is doing, is already a hub of activity, right? So we were talking earlier about, you know, Packard Place and the American Underground and these, um, you know, Atlanta Tech Villages, which is where we started in Atlanta. Um, so being a, adding an educational component to a place where there's already a lot of stuff going on is really neat, right? So we can, uh, and we offer, you know, free crash courses and kids' classes in the tech space and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's really exciting. In other communities, especially smaller ones that have less established tech hubs, we can actually kind of be a space where meetups can meet for free, you know, and other things like that, where it's like, hey, here's, you know, trying to develop some level of concentration or economies of scale, to your point. So um, that's the way that I've seen us interact with. And thinking yeah. about an ecosystem, it's really, it is multifaceted and there are, the enterprise players are just as important as the individual entrepreneur. And so when you have folks going through the iron yard who then go get placed at some of these bigger companies, that network stays connected. And so then you really are able to pull them all together and create a more complete ecosystem, which is great. Yeah. So you guys are almost like the glue <laughs> of the ecosystem. Um, one thing you mentioned that I thought was interesting and, and kind of speaks to Abby's experience um, 
you mentioned that some of the communities have a lot of different spaces and things that are kind of connected. Now, Abby, you started at Packard Place. You were, you know, on the founding team there, and now you're at another space and down the street, it sounds like. So in your experience, why is it important to have these, these multiple spaces, these multiple players in the community? Um, and, and how do they work together without feeling competitive? I think that um, that's one of the most important things that a city could have is multiple resources um, without those resources feeling competitive. Um, when it comes to entrepreneurship, uh, it's really something that's inside of you that speaks to you. And you're, maybe you're, in my case, I was you know, thinking about um, a better way for families to um, book and pay their babysitter. So that was really important to me. It was a, a space that I had experience with. And um, when I sat down to work on that idea, I wanted somewhere where I felt comfortable, where I felt inspired, where there was mm -hmm. an air of creativity. But those, um, uh, how I feel those things might be different from how somebody else feels those things. So having uh, different spaces around the city where people can say, you know, this is really my fit. I feel great here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I know people here, that's why I'm here. Or maybe I don't know anybody here, that's why I'm here. Uh, so the different options for entrepreneurs or even entrepreneurs to have to go around the city really um, speaks to the variety. And just like, just like with anything else, you need competition, you need variety because it holds, it, it, it's the rising tides. If, um, if there was only one place, then that was the only standard, uh, mm -hmm. then what fun is that? Uh, you need uh, multiple places to really get the most out of your entrepreneurs and the most out of the city. Definitely. Now I'm gonna kind of throw a question out to the audience here, because I hope you guys are paying attention. Raise your hand if y'all, if any of y'all have had to go out and raise money for anything. Yep. Was it was it easy? Nod your head if it was easy. No, it wasn't easy, right? Now, you guys in various communities, we hear in Atlanta, we hear other places, there's no capital. Is that the truth or is it you have to kind of hustle a little bit and figure it out. What do you, I'm just going to throw it out. Anyone take this one. There's way too much money in real estate. And it chases <laughs> yeah. all the time. So we need to go to the real estate developers and ask for money. When you're on the front page of the Wall Street Journal for over ambition of building, yeah, maybe you're being a little too loose with it. <laughs> that's, I defer. I think, um, you know, I've done a good bit of traveling. We have a bunch of campuses and we were doing the accelerator stuff. Um, and I was out in Silicon Valley a good bit, and I've never been in a place where they don't complain about raising money, right? Mm -hmm. Whether that's Greenville, South Carolina, or whether that's San Francisco. Um, so I, I don't think it's a, I personally don't think the general concept of capital is something that entrepreneurs in smaller ecosystems can necessarily hang their hat on and say like this is the one ingredient that's keeping us from being really successful right mm -hmm. i do think there's a case for seed stage capital because it's harder to travel and get smaller rounds of seed stage capital so mm -hmm. i think that is really i definitely think that's important but <clears throat> i mean in my experience and um you know you probably have more experience in this because of all the traveling and investment stuff but money follows traction Right? Yeah. I mean, that's the bottom line is that money follows traction. And it w if your company is growing and it's going to make money, like capital will find you. The other thing is, like, if you're having trouble raising money locally, then just get on a plane and beat the bricks. And, and when you are successful in raising a bunch of money, it's going to make the local investors upset that they didn't get in on the round. Mm -hmm. So it's always uh, seemed like a flawed argument of supply and demand. It's trying to throw more supply to increase demand. And, right. and again, this is easy for me outside looking in, but it's beyond the seed stage, as you mentioned. But it's if you're continuing to build stuff that's really impactful, the money will be there yeah. at yeah. some point. I think that. I mean, the money's there. I mean, all these communities have money. People with money have some way that they decide to allocate that out. You know, it's to the general market or real estate. And so I think the question is not exactly like, how do we find more money? It's how do we convince them to reallocate some of the ways that they're funding current things now into new businesses at different stages. And I mean, I think the point is, yeah, it, it's, it's traction. So I think all the time it's, it's investments, this leading indicator of success and this lagging indicator of success. And it's just kind of bullshit because it's not always the case. It's, it's not always following that line. 
I think that instead of trying to get the investment community engaged, because that's all we ever do is let's set up angel networks and angel education networks and education networks to educate the educators of the, I mean, it's just, it goes on and on. Go out and talk to the corporate community. I mean, it's, it's go talk. If I was here, I mean, if I was starting a company, I'd look at who all the large corporate players are, the AT&Ts and the Coca-Colas and the different groups that ask which one of them is cur like, currently engaged with this non-traditional model of R&D, this we're gonna go acquire new young businesses or work with them or license them or participate in accelerator programs. But if you can engage that community and they start working and they provide early traction through early partnerships and early customers of these startups, you're gonna get money. Cause yeah, if you're making money, first if you're making money, you might not have to raise money. So that's great. <laughs> if you can get enough good customers, don't ever worry about it. But if you're in a position where you do need to raise money, if you're making money, that'll happen. I don't think it's vice versa. So I think instead of going to the investment community and trying to convince them that this is safe and you want to invest in this, and I promise it's going to do well, it's just not working. We've been trying that for three or four years now. We got to get more engaged with the corporate community and go and saying, you're falling behind. You know, it's Detroit. We had a meeting with the CTOs of the big three motor companies and some startups that were in the space. And it was one of the more uncomfortable meetings that we've had because they just didn't agree. And it was to the point where us and Steve had to be like, well, you disagree, but you're failing. Like everyone else is succeeding and you're not. Let's talk about why. Like you're not being able to innovate. And if you can change that narrative in Detroit, and if you can get those big three automakers to come in instead of saying we can do this internally because you can't, you're failing. The world sees you as a failure at this point. Go out in the community and find some really smart young people or not even young people, just some really smart people who are doing something new and give them the opportunity to change things for you. And then capital will follow from there. Okay. Capital yeah. follows traction, but like you're saying, it's connectivity. And I think it's if you're creating and you're in a silo and you're not connected, like you guys are saying, then it, then it becomes really hard as soon as you get connected and kind of shake that ecosystem up. And if you have a great product, it's going to come. Like at the village, we're in Buckhead, right? Buckhead's the financial district of Atlanta. And everyone's like, why would David Cummings build this tech hub in Buckhead? It's all where all the money is, all the bank money, the private money. There was such a huge concentration. So it seemed weird, but we've only been around for two and a half years. And we have the chambers in there. We had Turner come and do an industry connect. So we constantly have our enterprise, Home Depot, Weather Channel, CNN, reaching out to us that say, hey, we want to learn and we want to hear pitches from your entrepreneurs. What's the latest technologies? How can we use it? We have VCs from the West Coast constantly reaching out to us like we want these pitches. So I think it's there. Money can travel. It's about who you're connected with. And if you don't know the right people, you just have to ask. So there's this whole kind of pay it forward mentality in the startup community that I think people don't always remember to utilize. And that's kind of why the village even exists is we, we try to create those connections and we get so many requests that we're almost 100% reactive. We don't even have to be proactive. So people are coming and they want to connect and help kind of ease that capital constraint. Well, it's, it impacts corporations from a fiscal standpoint as well. I mean, so there's a huge trend in Atlanta right now where NCR moving their headquarters from suburbs right here in Tech Square. Sage Path moving to Atlantic Station, there's a world pay rather moving to Atlantic Station. A bunch of these companies are relocating back into the city primarily for hiring reasons. You know, they want to have close access to the talent. A lot of them are putting in these innovation centers, these kind of somewhat collaborative spaces to work with entrepreneurs. What that model looks like, I don't think we've really figured out yet to where you can really leverage it up. But that's where some of these conversations where you're referencing, you know, are you looking at it as an alternative R&D method? Things like that. That's where it gets really interesting to me. And I just don't think we've quite figured out that model yet, here yeah. in Atlanta at least. And one other thing too, is because I've been really frustrated by this whole capital conversation at times lately. It's like MailChimp. How many of you guys are familiar with MailChimp here in Atlanta, right? What did MailChimp do? They never took any funding. They haven't taken any funding thus far. They went to like, you know, they're in Atlanta. Let's go to these large corporate organizations. Let's get them on our platform. Let's start making money. And here we are 12 or 15 years later with an organization worth I don't even know how much, I'm gonna guess hundreds of millions of dollars. That's never taken a dollar. I'm not saying bootstrapping is the easiest thing to do, but I would spend way more of my time going out and trying to acquire clients, big name clients, and develop partnerships with organizations that are trusted by your community and the investment community, and then see what happens with investments. So well, they did exactly what you referenced earlier. I mean, they looked around at what resources were available to them in their hometown that they were in, in the B2B space, and went around and cultivated those relationships. Yeah. And 
Atlanta, if anything, certainly has a huge plethora of resources that relates to big corporations. Yeah. And with that strong network, with that strong community that has been established, you can kind of spend a, a maybe a little longer than, you know, you're not going to exit in a year, but to work your way into those networks, into those communities, and ask for help. I think that's something that people don't always remember is just ask. And like 99% of the time people are willing to help. That's actually something I read recently about the difference between Silicon Valley and other places is people are overwhelmingly willing to help. And I think in the South we get a little, you know, we're, we're, we're polite and we don't want to impose. Um, but you know, people are willing to help. And so I think that's something we could work on. Um, what do you guys, how about in your own communities? Are there things that you could work on to make an even stronger community? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the funding conversation is really interesting in Charlotte. I mean, we're a huge banking city, so you think, well, if there's all this money here, then mm -hmm. how come um, people are still struggling to find funding or they're complaining about it? Um, but the, maybe inside, in. I think that staying realistic can be very helpful. Um, to say that you are going to uh, meet somebody and tell them your idea and they're going to write you a million dollar check just really isn't always going to happen. Um, but to your point, asking for help, saying, hey, I have this problem, um, how, can I, how can I fix it? Because if I can fix this, then my platform is going to go to a whole different level that then might attract funding. So mm -hmm. take it one step at a time or at least in Charlotte, we're trying to really take it one step at a time and not get too caught up in the funding mm -hmm. um, as so you don't um, crush your dreams per se, so you don't think that um, your, your company, your startup is never going to lift off because you don't have any funding. On the other side, um, it could be an issue of finding the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes investors really only want to invest large sums of money where a company might say, hey, I need $10,000, but it might not be worth it to the investor. So really taking a look at what our ecosystem looks like, what our investor ecosystem looks like, and finding the sweet spot for everyone. Um, but at the same time, staying realistic. And, and like uh, what the panel has said about MailChimp and other, uh, other companies, you might not need funding. You might need users mm -hmm. instead of funding. What, what if you spent that energy going out and finding users and finding feedback? Um, because then you get enough traction, the funding will come. Um, so finding your own path and not just solely relying on, uh, well, if I get money, then I'll blow up, because that, that isn't necessarily always the truth. Atlanta Tech Village exists from a bootstrapped company. So our founder, David Cummings, had Pardot, which was a marketing automation firm, bootstrapped it, never took funding, sold it for $100 million, turned around and purchased the building. So for us, I think having the private sector, having an entrepreneur who was personally successful and instead of going and you know taking a lot of time off work and buying amazing things, which is probably what I would have done. <laughs> you know, he turned around and purchased a 1986 building in Buckhead with his own money, did a huge renovation with, that, with the single-minded goal of giving back to the Atlanta startup community and uh, kind of help drive Atlanta into one of the top five tech hubs. So I think something that Atlanta needs to see is more and more successful entrepreneurs kind of taking that, their personal funding and their personal stories and, and continue to give back and invest back into the community where they came from. And I think we're starting to see that more and more, which is super encouraging. I, and this is, I always avoid this because it's a, it's a conversation everywhere that you go and it's a problem everywhere, but I will talk because it's Atlanta about diversity for a moment and kind of what that means. And I think instead of talking about it as a problem on the rise of the rest, one of the only cities that we've really directly had conversations surrounding it was here because I think that there's a lot of success in it here. And we were having a conversation earlier. Have you guys ever read The Innovator's Dilemma? Is anybody? I'm trying to understand it. It's really complicated. It's over my head. Um, but they say a big problem is it looks at as companies grow and are able to serve new markets to their customers, they're always looking up at what the existing market is and that oftentimes they lose track of what's going on or they lose the ability to innovate because something comes up from underneath them. And so it was disk drives and they kept getting smaller, but as they got smaller, they held less space and the only people that wanted them were in 
desktops and then laptops, which weren't as important as big giant computers, but then the disk could hold more and they could serve a higher market, but the established companies kept losing. And I think that that speaks really to diversity because the landscape of the world and the nation's changing and you're looking at growing and shrinking markets. And the truth is the shrinking market is, is me, it's white males, it's kind of what's dominated all media and marketing and, and commerce for the past forever. And you're seeing an insurgence of, of a different type of market. I mean, it, it's female leadership and it's, it's understanding the female sector and African-American sector. And so I think if it's so necessary not, and Atlanta has like a disproportionately large population of upper and middle class African Americans than most places in America. And what we've seen here was a ridiculous amount of talent from that community. My favorite company that's ever run Rise of the Rest is Park Pick um, here from Atlanta. And they kill it. I mean, it's unbelievable. The Jewel's amazing. I mean, they're all amazing, but they come at it from a different perspective. And so I think you've got to see full integration of both of those communities. And we talk about having spaces that are comfortable for everyone, which is absolutely necessary, but it's also a fine line between making sure that those groups get together because I'll meet a young black entrepreneur and he'll have an idea and I'll be like, you should contact me. We have a fund. They'll go to the website. They'll find Nasir who works for us, who's a black guy, and they'll email, they'll email him and not me after I've talked to him. And they've never even talked to him, but it's who they're comfortable with. And the truth is he understands that market better than I do. He always is going to. I mean, a female market. I, you know, I have conversations with my girlfriend all the time who it's you know female it's sarah blakely and spanx that she had the ability to understand something that no one else did she struggled yeah. no one would give her money because like it's a stupid idea but she was a female and she was talking to a bunch of males who dominated the industry so i think every community if you're building a team and you have five white guys on your team do not make your next hire a white guy not because i really care about diversity i mean i do but what i care more about is building successful businesses that can look down and see what's coming up and it's that diversity of opinion that comes from diversity of leadership or diversity of team that's gonna be able to see that. So pay really close attention to that. And Atlanta has the opportunity to get so far ahead of the national curve on that and create these businesses that can serve a much broader market. And I would be taking advantage of that immediately if I was here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with a diverse community, um, you know, comes change and Ben from the from the real estate perspective. I think there's been a lot of change here in Atlanta, particularly in the last couple of years, um, with this kind of new type of of office space, this like shared co work environment. Right. Have you seen from your perspective? Have you seen a big impact there? Certainly, um, it's it's absolutely necessary. Um, I mean, if you look at how the real estate investment model is set up, it's not conducive for startups. I mean, the value extraction is having stabilized long-term credit tenants in a building for long periods of time, which startups are, don't hit any of those criteria. And so, these co-working environments that allows you to kind of share the overall cost of building out conference space and equipment for printers, things, I mean, all the stuff that you need to have to function as an office space and spreading it out among a very wide base of membership, it allows, it gives you that space and allows for some of the serendipity, all that type of stuff to occur in a built environment space. And so absolutely it's a critical part into the whole stack. And I think some of the more forward thinking landlords and developers see, well, we want that in our building as a feeder system for the rest of our building. You know, once this company is at a late round and they, you know, making money and they actually have some financials that they can show us, then, you know, then it becomes like, well, fine, yeah, we're willing to take that risk for you to at least 20,000 square feet. And so, and where we're seeing it evolve, um, and this is what's really, really interesting to me. So Tech Village has had a tremendous impact on real estate in Buckhead. And you're seeing a lot of the companies spill over into buildings that are next door that are, suburban office buildings basically they just happen to be right next door to atlanta tech village and so now these landlords are going in there and they're popping out the ceiling tiles they're building a bocce ball court they're doing these things and they're calling it creative office space which is a term i despise <laughs> it's just it's what does creative office space mean and so we're working on a project right now um, surrounding uh, the Sweetwater Brewery. Uh, a couple of uh, client of mine has purchased a number of buildings and building a creative district. And so while we would say, and, and we're not certainly the people who've come up with these ideas, but some of the more traditional office buildings do those types of kind of, they follow the trend and they almost are trying to, well, look, it's creative office space. You can see the ceiling. Come on, you're tech. And like, <laughs> that, it's more than that. 
And so we're putting a lot of focus into what is that programmatic, what is that curation activities? Can that be replicated across industries? So I mean, again, this, our focus is more of a creative district, and so obviously the TAMI sector will be the, the tenant mix that we're looking at for Army Yards. And, but we're looking at what are those engagement models that are gonna get really, really interesting, and how can you really foster conversations among people who are from different industries, but like you said, that's where something really unique can happen. How do you build a physical space that gives someone, I mean, basically like this almost, I mean, you have a chance for someone to get in front of other groups of people and collaborate on issues. Um, and so that's where it's heading, in my opinion. Um, real estate is not afraid just to follow trends as, as long as they can until it no longer makes money and then they go to the next trend. Um, we're placing a bet on if you build some unique environments that are heavily focused on design to begin with, um, followed up with thoughtful curation, that what you build is brand loyalty for a project. And, and that's why Tech Village, you see these companies want to stay in close proximity to Tech Village because there is that loyalty, there is that community. And so the same things that we've been mentioning from a Boulder thesis, we want to basically replicate that exact, model, that exact same model just within a creative district. And mm -hmm. so that's where I hope the mentality of real estate developers heads. And you can see that evidenced here in Tech Square over the last decade. Um, it, we used, this used to be a bunch of parking lots, not this building because it's historic, but Tech Square used to be just a whole bunch of parking lots and Georgia Tech was on the other side of the highway. But it's evolved and it's grown and there are all these little things popping up and it takes time. And so it's been, from one perspective, it's amazing to see what's happen at Atlanta Tech Village where three years ago you know it was just a bunch of dudes walking around in suits and Buckhead and now it's this very interesting mix of cool people and and interesting ideas and things happening and um, personally I actually work over in Armory Yards now so I'm super excited yeah. because I was really sad leaving the village like oh my gosh now I have to go back to traditional corporate work life this sucks but the company that I work for is where you guys are developing that new district. So I'm it's, just really you know, it, And it gets to, <laughs> sorry to go back on this, but <laughs> you know, it, it gets into that, how you can improve your community. And so one of the areas that I do see Atlanta could be tremendously um, more efficient at is how you collaborate across industries. So I am a firm believer that the built environment can influence behavior. And I don't mean just office space, I mean the belt line, I mean Piedmont mm -hmm. Park, I mean all these built assets that we put into the ground. And how is a development community serving the technology sector? And I don't think those conversations are taking place. And so how can we get together and kind of figure out what it is, what are the resources that you really do need to kind of really help continue to build this ecosystem? Because again, there's plenty of money in real estate for the right idea. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, it's, it's very almost kind of shallow attempts to penetrate that area. And so I don't think those conversations are going deep enough yet. Mm. So we've kind of come full circle. We've talked about the startup community being an ecosystem and how all these different aspects of it are key to creating a successful ecosystem and successful community. Um, I want to turn it over to you guys now and have y'all have a chance to ask questions of the panelists. Um, so, does anyone have any question they want to ask? Yes. So, you're talking a lot about raising money, et cetera. A lot of talk about um, not having investors getting together. Do you see that? <laughs> There's a lot of struggle. Do you see that as something viable or something you know, an ATV or a lot of the startups are they getting money from that as a new or? So I'm going to repeat the question just for the sake of the video. So you're asking about non-accredited investors and, and maybe crowdfunding. You're talking about crowdfunding too. So is that a viable thing in your communities and where do you see that going? I definitely think so. That's a viable option in our community, um, especially if you don't know much about the investor scene. I mean, that's friends and family. You can get a lot of money from friends and family. Um, crowdsourcing, unaccredited, unaccredited investors of sorts. You know, you always have to do your homework when um, you're going into waters that you're kind of unfamiliar with. But um, I mean, entrepreneurship is all about breaking barriers and coming up with new creative ideas. So I would personally, that would definitely be a route that um, I would explore. Well said, I agree. It's the same thing um, in the village specifically. Most of the startups are going to have that kind of initial friends and family around, and it almost 
to me, it almost highlights the kind of hustle ability. Um, you know, how much have you actually tried to raise your own money? How much have you utilized your network? How much do you believe in it? How much do the people immediately surrounding you believe in you and the product? Because the product, but it's also they're investing in you as the entrepreneur. Um, and so to me, that gets a lot of buy-in. I, I mean more later on in the stage, oh. like after so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that money, if you need money, money is good to have money sometimes, but I also think you got to recognize what you're giving up with that. So in some cases, you're building in an early adoption market, especially with the crowdfunding and being able to get people on board early. But I think when looking for investors, there's a lot more that they should be able to or that you're hoping they bring to the table in terms of partnerships. And I know like when Steve Case, the first thing he's going to ask you is if you could meet with or if you could partner with any three organizations, who would they be? The reason he asked that question is not just so he knows what you're thinking or that you're thinking about it, but it's do I know any of those people? Because if I do, then maybe I can help advance this cause a lot quicker. And in crowdfunding and with just this general purpose funding, you're probably not going to run into that as much. So I think that there's there's the good and the bad to it. Yes. There are competitions like Boys Dream North um, out in Buffalo that draw attention to a city and really get the world kind of talking about you know Buffalo as you know, a tech hub or even just an entrepreneurial hub. Uh, do you think there's a need for something like that in Atlanta? Because I know most of the competitions are usually limited to startups in the southeast area. Um, but do you think there's a way, whether it's a competition or other ways, to kind of draw attention to the city? I'm open for any idea to have this type of conversations. I mean, it's, it's my biggest issue um, is I felt for a long time Atlanta's had the mentality of we're cheap with an airport that'll take you anywhere. Um, and there's so much more to it than that. And there's so much talent, there's so much creativity that's really building up right now. And it's, so anything, any sort of platform, I mean, this conference is a great you know, example of, of moving that forward. And that's why we're all here. Um, does it turn into an Austin city limits? Probably not, because again, you, know, you figure out what your personality is as the city, and you figure out what's the best way to kind of celebrate the culture of that city. And, and there's various forms that that can take. Um, so. And Atlanta, you know, we, I think part of the biggest feedback that I've so, heard so, is that so. we're not always great at kind of touting our own success. So it's a little bit of that culture, um, like Aaron was even talking about, where we're nice and we're polite. Um, I think it's really time we stop being humble. And I think our culture and kind of our branding as a city and these kind of conversations are continuing to kind of put us front and forward. And the more we can do that and the more big successes we have, the better. Jordan. Then you mentioned the, the plane crash, the arts community, art and creativity go hand in hand, and creativity and startups go hand in hand. Like, what are you seeing in the arts world and how it works with technology on that? So where do you think that can grow? That is a very good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, y'all might be way in as well on how you've seen good examples. Let me, and I'll try and put some thought about Atlanta specifically. Yeah, I think um, just for this isn't about Atlanta, but Greenville, just a couple hours up the road. Um, there's a group called the Makers Collective, and they put on this thing called the Indie Craft Parade, and it's a really interesting. Um, it's basically people who make handmade goods. It's like Etsy, but live, I would say. Um, to use a very startup-y type comparison. Uh, it's Etsy, face-to-face. -face. Um, uh, but it's interesting because it's really, these people are running their own startups, right? It's an individual person who's making a good, like they're an entrepreneur. Now they're not gonna go out and raise money, right? They're just really, it's a lot of people trying to make a living making what they really wanna make, right? Um, and that's been going on for a couple of years, but it has really spawned some interesting businesses that have grown. And again, I think, we have a very strong tendency to look at like SaaS exit as the benchmark for entrepreneurial activity. And I don't, I think that, I don't think that that's, I think that can be a very unhealthy lens to use. So for example, there have, have been people just sort of out of that indie craft parade type movement start, um, you know, whatever, a t-shirt printing business that's turned into a national brand, right? Someone who makes, you know, um, 
you know, really fancy denim jeans, you know, handmade denim jeans. People who have started like coffee shops, right? Like, you know, I want to be part of a creative culture and all of the coffee shops sucked, right? And they were basically like, we need something like an octane that's like, like a legitimate coffee shop. So I've seen the arts community really drive a lot of people who say, I want to create a higher standard for X and I'm going to do it and I'm going to start a business. And they're not like huge businesses, they're just small businesses. But I think the energy has come around someone saying like, and I'm working this day job and I'm really passionate about, you know, making nice jeans. Like, well, go do that, you know, and start it. So we've seen that really bleed over because a lot of people gathering the arts community together and all those people saying, wow, there are so many people actually making a living, making something. Um, has spurred on entrepreneurial activity and I think bled over into the tech space and been really encouraging to a lot of people. Have you ever been to Nashville? Has anybody ever been to Nashville? You go to Nashville and you ask somebody what they do, what do they say? I'm, like, oh, I'm an artist, I'm a country music artist. And you're like, well, how do you make money? Right. They're like, oh, well, I'm a waiter, I do such right. and such. <laughs> um, and, and that's fine, but I think that what you see is it, there, there's when you are an artist of any type you take a very autonomous approach to life like you're doing it on your own you're creating from within you're 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 making your yourself and then to go from that into a corporate environment can be pretty difficult and so we have a lot of like mentors like sherry stewart deutschman who's you know kind of consistently in nashville or tennessee like an entrepreneur of the year started a company called letter logic where they mail letters and she tells the story of going to the bluebird cafe which is this little cafe where everybody starts out going there the first night she moved to nashville to be a country music star hearing the first person go up on stage it was like four o'clock in the afternoon no one was there it was gonna be the worst act of the night and realizing how much better that person was than her and she quit that day and would last one day in the music industry and then decided that she was going to go do something else. And so I think that within the artist community, you see people that are willing to take chances and do something different, like he says, and take a creative approach. And so you really do have to foster it. Um, the corporate community doesn't always love that because they kind of look down on them, not recognizing that a lot of these new wave of entrepreneurs and business builders are people that started off like that too. So I do think it's it's important. It's unique. You get a lot of bad ideas with it too. Sure. Um, but you get a lot of bad ideas with college kids. You get a lot of bad ideas from everyone except people who have had a few either successful or non-successful <laughs> businesses. So you just got to deal with it. It's it's a quality of life discussion. Um, I mean, where it kind of all converges to me. So I mean, you can you can have a ton of talent, but if the actual space that these people live is not a pleasant environment to be in. They're not going to stick around. I mean, if you're talented enough and you're mobile, you, you'll go to wherever you can. So, how do you kind of bring all these components of a community together to where you really have a sustainable quality of life and something that's kind of organically shaped over time and that's built by the people who are the makers, that are the um, the artisans? I mean, there's great examples of, in Atlanta of the same thing. The, the pop-up markets with craftsmen and artisans and. From a real estate perspective, I mean, for the Army Arts Project, for example, we've we've engaged Wonder Root to come and help us figure out where pieces should be placed and where it should be done in a thoughtful fashion. That's not our area of expertise, but we do see it as being critically important to the project overall. Um, we're trying to have conversations with the Foster ATLs and the Root City Markets around town, and saying, you know, one, we're, once we're to scale, we we really want to participate in you because what we're ultimately trying to provide is experience. We don't want to just provide you come to work and you sit there and then you hate it and then you go home. You want to have just full experience kind of immersed all throughout the day. Um, and so, I, mean, I think arts plays a huge component in that, just the way I think tech does as well. It's all kind of part of building what we're going to be. One other thing, just an interesting sort of, I thought of an example. Um, there's a woman in Greenville who's an artist and she does these paintings and she's gotten really popular. Um, I mean, I was in New York and just walking around and I was like, oh, that looks like one of this person's paintings. And it was, you know, it was just really interesting. So she gotten really popular, but her business runs through Instagram. Like that's her e-commerce platform, if you will, right? Which might be the worst, like I can't think of a worse thing than trying to sell something through Instagram, right? It's like not really built for that, right? But what's fascinating is she has become as popular for like sort of being someone who has built an e-commerce platform on a non-e-commerce platform, which is super interesting, right? So I think that's where sort of art and technology, things like that can converge because there are a lot of people saying like, how did you do this? How do you manage this, right? And so she's really become sort of an advocate for using social media, you know, to get your art out there and become really successful. So stuff like that's really interesting to see where tech and art cross. 
And expanding on that, I think um, tech entrepreneurs can take a lesson from artists. Artists are always the first ones to take a risk or to do something that might be unpopular or to do it in their own way. Um, and that sometimes, especially in the South, you might be a little bit hesitant um, to go that extra mile or do that weird thing um, that you think is is really out there. Um, I know one of my coworkers just went through the um, Innovation Institute, uh, which is a um, usually for artists, uh, but they do open it up to professionals, and it's a two-day workshop, um, and you really just learn different ways of being innovative. And she was sharing a story about how their um, what they needed, the, the activity was that they were blindfolded and they needed to draw to music um, for like two minutes and then when that was done they needed to do something very bold to uh, their drawing. And the point of the exercise was to show you that if you think that uh, your act was bold, then look around because everybody else thought that and really you need to do the next thing and that's really what's bold. It's not like, oh, I'm going to tear it in half or I'm going to color it in. Well, everybody else has already figured that out. So what are you going to do that's really next, next? And artists have had their finger on the pulse of what is next and what is bold for so long that I think tech entrepreneurs can uh, really look to that and say, well, you know, how can I be as bold as some of the artists around me? That's a good point. Anyone else have any questions? No? I'll throw one. Yeah. Uh, curious about your thoughts around your role or responsibility in sort of the upbringing of new entrepreneurs, and particularly as it relates to disadvantaged communities, we don't see kind of really non-traditional entrepreneurs, lack of connectivity in neighborhoods, we talk a lot about tech, these are people who don't even have an opportunity to engage, so how do you bring them along uh, to feed that pipeline to continue to, to know what you're all talking about? I think, kind of, there, there's a, I think it's, it's all of our responsibility. Again, I think it's good for business as much as anything else. I think that we're finding that there are companies that are trying to take a technical, like build out a solution for that. And so in San Francisco next month, we're working with Kpore Capital and Google and we have $100,000 for a company that can present a solution to us that eliminates hiring bias. But we want a way to do that. And the reason that we're gonna invest in it is because we see it as a very investable business because businesses have to start doing that, getting back to the conversation about hiring people with different viewpoints because it will give you that competitive advantage. And so I think that like most things, if the market supports it and if there's a return for it, then we'll see it happen faster and faster. And I'm hoping, and, and I think this could be the case, that that will happen. I also think that there's some more technical solutions, some really cool, the Gallup poll that does the personality testing. Uh, the CEO of the Gallup poll has developed a test and he thinks that it can identify someone who is a great business builder. And so just a certain set of inherent qualities, he's given it to tons of people, he's found that it pretty much is very, it's very in line with the actual outcome. So finding people who have been really successful, they do well. In this startup community, there's a lot of people who just decide that they're gonna be startup community leaders and, and aren't so much, not very knowledgeable about it. Me probably being one of those, I do bad on the test. Um, but they are going to give it out to every 11th grader in the city of Detroit. And it's kind of the thought, if you're, I mean, if you're a really solid basketball player, you're a point guard in Omaha, you can get found eventually. You're, you know, if you're playing basketball, at least you're exposed to it and you keep playing, you're gonna get recruited, you're gonna find your way to a college. If you're good enough, you're gonna find your way into the NBA. Like there's a spotlight shined on it because we know how to identify them. We can see it, we can see that you were, you are good at what you do. Business building is a little different. But I think as we start to develop these tools that we'll see them more in play, because another thing is it's an investment opportunity. I would love to know what 11th grader in the city of Detroit, what young black kid that really understands his market is going to be a killer. And he's going to be able to develop something for a market that I don't understand. And I'll invest in that really, really quickly. So I think in saying that, that I think we're going to see a transition as financially it's supported and the thought of inclusion are supported by a general market, that there are gonna be more and more solutions that are provided for that. On a really granular level, <laughs> Atlanta Tech Village, one of our core values is pay it forward and we actually do spend a good bit of our time and resources 
in partnering with different nonprofits in Atlanta. Uh, we have Europe students that we connect for internships and jobs with startups. We have volunteer days. We have school field trips where the kids come and they can speak with entrepreneurs and we can show them the space and talk about you know, what it could look like to, to one day work in this kind of space. We host kids uh, coding camps for free. So we have um, a lot of cool opportunity to kind of connect and whenever we kind of get an ask, we almost always say yes or do what we can to support them. So we're really passionate about it. So if anybody ever wants to kind of make that connection, we're always open to it. Yeah, uh, similar for us. I mean, it's a huge question and multifaceted answer that needs a lot of different people at the table, um, which is great. I think it's challenging, and I think it's a it's you know a, a noble challenge that everyone should be focused on. We do free kids classes um, as our way of doing that, right? That's something we can do really well. We have natural resource in that. We can do it in every community where we go, so we can do it, you know, on a really wide scale. Um, I think we have a lot of work to do around figuring out how do we offer those classes in places where, um, you know, in places in the community where people wouldn't naturally have access, right? Like maybe your parents can't drive you there, right? Maybe there's a hardware barrier, right? So we're looking at community centers and a lot of other things trying to figure out how we can increase access. Um, but we kind of look at it as just, you know, really, ex you know, opening up the hood of technology and demystifying it for kids. And with the proliferation of gaming and smartphones, um, penetrating at a really young age, even in communities that don't have a whole lot of connection, people are familiar with that. And so if you can go into a community and say, we'll teach you how to build a video game, right? You, you instantly can get a ton of people involved. It's really exciting. So that's the way that we're looking at approaching it in each of our communities. We have a ton of work to do. Everyone has a ton of work to do. But um, I think the point is, are we actively thinking about it and moving forward in that? So That's where it gets interesting, those types of concepts being applied to the traditional education model. I mean, it's. I'm fortunate and involved in a number of things around the city that hit all sorts of kind of facets. And it always boils back down to education to me. Um, your greatest ability to combat hunger, your greatest ability to combat homelessness, financial literacy, job retention, economic stability, all these things, you can take it back to a very granular level, back to basic education. And my, I'd like to see it evolve more towards teaching critical thinking and problem solving necessarily than material itself. Um, uh, you know, especially as technology continues with the proliferation that it is, it's a lot of times what you're learning is irrelevant in such a very short period of time. I'd rather have people leaving these programs with the ability to think logically, think critically, and just problem solve. Um, and things like that are a great example of hands-on experience that kind of puts you immersed in that opportunity. I think we're going to see one thing that we've been talking about recently is this is very specific, but. We've tried to use community centers, libraries, other places like that, and it's really tough because even there, you know, it's you can't necessarily always get a high level of penetration in the community or ever. So, we've been talking about building a cart that can fit on the back of a truck that just folds down and has a bunch of computers, so you can just go anywhere, right? Like, you know, you have a hotspot and you can just you're not limited by a physical space, right? We can roll in with a truck you know, roll this thing off and just have, you know, 10 Raspberry Pis and a couple of screens and just go at it, you know, and you're, there's no geographic limitation. And so that, I think, those type of ideas for us, like how can we, instead of trying to, um, in communities, collect people in one place, just take this stuff to them. Like we have the technological ability to do that. So again, like, I think there's a ton of ideas that are going to be really exciting in the next, next couple of years. I want to thank you guys for being here with us and participating, and I especially want to thank our panelists for joining us. Thank you so much, and I hope you guys have a good weekend. Thanks. Thank you.